Alrighty. Oh, they're high. <laughs> So we've probably got some uh, people watching the intro commercials. Do I have commercials on this one? I should probably say commercials for it. So hello, Heather. All right. This is probably where the video starts and people start coming on. Well, hello there, good people. Hi, I'm Jason with Green Country Agroforestry, and it's Wednesday night, 7.30 p.m. Central Time. That's Central U.S. Time, so it's time for another live stream. Um... I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight who is here tonight. everybody all three or four of you who are actually in here <clears throat> so if you're here a couple weeks ago you saw the day that i actually kind of threw that song together and started playing with it oh yeah it's a little bit new and we got somebody writing in cyrillic i'm sorry i don't have the ability to translate the cyrillic but but welcome aboard good to see you Sassafras Red is here. We got Eric Hale here, Katie Moyer. I was wishing us all happy holidays. And uh, I, 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 I don't even know how I'm supposed to pronounce Mumbaira is in here as well. Mary's out there somewhere parking trailers tonight. You know, she's out there working really hard trying to get things delivered. And you may have noticed that there are some shortages on the grocery store shelves here and there. Maybe not so much. They're out of everything, but there's less of some things. And, you know, the supply chain shortages, they do happen. As a matter of fact, this is a joke. This is a joke. As a matter of fact, supply chain shortages being what they are, it's getting really hard to find a case of corona these days. Fortunately, you can still get a quart of it. Too soon? Okay, too soon. Well, hello, everybody. So tonight's topic was, we did not go to the moon, which is a lot of fun. Well, you know, whenever they did the first circumnavigation of the moon prior to the moon landing, there was a, a, a radio back to, uh, to, to, to control that says, Houston, there is a Santa Claus. And that was kind of the inspiration for the thumbnail for this video. There's, Houston, there is a Santa Claus. And there's a lot of speculation going on about what that meant. I mean, is, did that mean that they were out there and they found evidence of extraterrestrials on the dark side of the moon? Like, just speculation runs rampant. I think maybe there's a possibility that the people who are circumnavigating and going around the other side of the moon were so caught up and excited with the magic of the moment that they said, yes, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. <laughs> and it had nothing to do with any sort of wild, weird, off-the-rails conspiracy theories that have come out. <clears throat> you're right. You're right. You're right. Sean's right. I, I, I need a... I need a ting. But, you know, guys, let's get serious here. We all know that the world rests on the back of several elephants. 
and those in turn can be found floating through the void on the back of a giant turtle. See what we did there? That's a Terry Pratchett thing. That's uh, Discworld, <laughs> the Discworld cosmology, if you guys didn't know. But if you were onto that from the very beginning, you'll like this next bit because I'm going to do a little bit of a, um, hello, Biggie. I'm going to do a little bit of an advertisement. It's not going to be long. It's not a paid advertisement. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's kind of an advertisement for another channel that I'm running right now. I just started one up uh, for um, people that like to follow the Dungeons & Dragons online game. I'm going to show you a clip of that real quick, and then we'll get to explaining why it is. Why it is that I could tell you with absolute sincerity that we did not go to the moon, and it is factually accurate no matter what it is that you actually believe, whether that moon landing was staged in a fake or, or not. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Let's go ahead. And <laughs> I can't repeat what Seth's breath read, so you'll just have to read the comments. <laughs> Let's go over here and I'll uh, do uh, this view right here and I'll I'll play this video. Hopefully you guys can hear it and it's not weird. You let me know in the comments if it comes out strange, okay? This here is up. Hi. My name is Mae Vani. How do you do? I think he's wondering how much My name's Sharon. Do you worms had better not forget it. <laughs> Voices were dubbed in at post. All right, let's just cut that right there and go right back there. That's a, that's just a, a little teaser trailer for the new channel called the Guild Channel. It's based around the Dungeons and Dragons online game. And um, right now, between now and the first of this, no, sorry, I'm lying. Right now, between now and December 31st is a great time to join DDO online because between now and the 31st of December, all you have to do is put in the promo code DDO Quest 2021 and you'll get all the content all the way up until this past year or so uh, for, for Dungeons and Dragons Online, which would save you a whole bunch of time trying to farm the favor to get that for free or paying the money to get it otherwise. Great Christmas gift. Incidentally, if you got kiddos or grandkids that would like to have a good video game that they can play, you know, you don't want to expose them to something that's going to, going to mess with their heads. And Dungeons and Dragons Online is one of those wonderful environments where the environment is more cooperative and not competitive. Unless, of course, the competition is who can contribute the most to the group, which is a great kind of contribution uh, uh, competition to have. There's not an area where people have to run around and fight with other players in order to get basic functions done, which is something that happens on other MMOs, which is the reason why I don't play them. You don't have to fight other players, was what I'm saying, in Dungeons and Dragons Online, which is wonderful. Also, um, let's see, it has a free-to-play option, which is really free-to-play, as opposed to the free-to-play option where you get into there and discover there's just things that you have to be able to do to stay up with the other players that you have to spend money on. This is not the case with Dungeons & Dragons Online. It is really, truly free-to-play, and the money that you spend it is just a little extra to speed things along for you. Okay, that's it. We're done with, this, with the commercial, uh, at least for DDO or the, the channel. Um, Vicky, you were asking about pecan seeds. Now, where did I put those? You were saying, how much will it cost for pecan seeds? Well, typically, I don't sell pecan seeds. I might sell pecan trees, which we can sprout from pecan seeds, well, from pecans. But since germination is not a guarantee, and also the specific pollination is not guaranteed either, Let's see, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. There's a good round dozen. Vicky, I will be boxing these dozen pecans up and sending them to you. And you don't have to pay me anything. I've got your address. <laughs> you can put these down into the ground, get them good and soaked, and let them germinate. And hopefully some of them will actually produce pecan trees for you. You know, the seedling that I started that I was keeping for myself, 
I already had it planted out there by the uh, by, by, by the kitchen, just outside the kitchen window. I went out there a few days ago. I'm a liar. I went out there last month, not long ago, just, just about a month ago, and discovered that it was gone, completely poof, gone. I mean, not 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 cut off, not gnawed off, not yanked under, not yanked, it, poof, gone. It just disappeared. So hopefully some of the some of the ones that I, I, I'm growing with air layering and cloning are going to come out. Mary says she's going to be late. <gasps> she's going to be late. <laughs> no cost. I'll, I'll ship them to you. Don't worry about it. And hopefully some of them will actually sprout for you. Now, something that if you want to actually buy something, you can go on to, onto our website, greencountryagriforestry.com. I can't talk. Greencountryagriforestry.com, where we have Hemery Callus Fulva, the classic orange daylily for sale. Six plants for, I think it was like $5, somewhere around there. Very low price. And we have just introduced these lovely little fellows. This is a rosemary with a bug on the side of it. Well, what do you expect? It's nature. Okay, <laughs> so rosemary plant grown from cutting. We've got them all started, rooted, and ready to go. You can start these indoors as an indoor plant. Wait until last frost before moving them outdoors. You don't want to move an evergreen as these are outdoors during the winter. So wait until after your last frost. Then you can move these outdoors. But they are available to order now if you would like to keep them indoors as houseplants until such a time as you can transplant them outdoors. That's at greencountryagroforestry.com. The website is greencountryagroforestry.com. These are $4.99. All right, here we go. Greg is in it with the Illuminati. <laughs> Vicky said, sea predators are called dinner around here. That's right. Uh, you know, we're not supposed to, to, to really talk about, about killing poor defenseless animals, but if you're a squirrel and you're eating my food, I'm, I'm, I'm coming after you and you're going to go in the stew pot. Hmm. I really wanted to start out tonight's show showing um, a little bit of food preparation because right now I'm making a stew with a whole bunch of stuff that we're growing around the, around the place. I've got some uh, some squash in there. There's some canna in there, uh, walking onions. I've got garlic in there. Carrots are in there. Technically, I didn't grow the carrots, but I'm growing carrots, so it kind of kind of counts. <laughs> we got sweet potato in there. Uh, before it's all done, I'll have some uh, some some dock greens that I'll chop up and throw in there as well. And for meat, I've got some. Um, oh, I forgot we have tomatoes, some some dehydrated tomatoes. Uh, for the meat, I've got a little bit of ham. Uh, I've got a friend that, or a couple of friends that that work at one of these uh, companies that packages and prepares the honey kissed, you know, spiced, uh, bake it yourself at home hams for for the holidays. And as it turns out, the, um, the outlet that they had for the hams below six six pounds has disappeared. So they don't have a, a place to sell them. And uh, a few of them came my way for very, 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 very cheap. So I've been doing a lot of work just getting these hams, cooking and preparing them, dehydrating and put them in, into jars. And some of that, some of that, uh, that nice... Uh, holiday ham that I've taken and dehydrated. I took about a good cup of it and put it into this, this soup that I'm in the middle of making. So it's going to be really good. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't, yeah, I don't think Craig's in it with you a little bit, Adi. <laughs> if he is, he's in an entirely different branch. <laughs> okay, I should probably, since we have all four of you watching, I should probably let you in on the gag. I said we did not go to the moon. This is true. We did not go to the moon. I can prove it. I did not go to the moon. And I would imagine that most of you who are watching here, almost all of you who are watching, did not personally also go to the moon. If you did not go to the moon and I did not go to the moon, then we did not go to the moon. Now, Buzz Aldrin and uh, Neil Armstrong, they may have gone to the moon. But that's not the point. You and I, we didn't. So we 
did not go to the moon. I hope that clears things up for you. Now, whenever somebody starts to tell you that we didn't go to the moon, you can go, yeah, that's absolutely true. We didn't go to the moon. And then we can change the subject quickly and move on to something else because we've established <laughs> we did not go to the moon. <laughs> that's right. All right. So for Vicky, we've got, I've got a dozen. I'll put them in a little box or a baggie. If you want more, I, I can I can grab some more for you. I just all I had was what was in this cup right here. The rest of them are outside. I can get more. There's still some on the tree that haven't fallen off yet. I'd be happy to give them to you. Eric says, "Dang, I got it." <laughs> I'm glad you got it. <laughs> hey, really quick, she's not on tonight, but I, I was talking about the. Uh, Gail Southern Living, one of our, one of our subscribers, sent us a sent us a little a little Christmas card here. It says, uh, "Christmas fills our homes with blessings." There we go. Personalized message in there. Probably can't read, and that's just fine. Well, thank you very much, Gail. At Gail Southern Living, guys, go check out Gail at Gail Southern Living if you want to see what's going on down in Texas. We've been enjoying some Texas type weather here in Oklahoma lately. Let me tell you, it's been great. I've been outside. Whew, can you see from this west? I've, I've been outside all day today, yesterday, earlier this past week. Let me get this crud off my glasses. I can, I can hardly see. Uh, I did a video release not too long ago that I, I, I put on there, something like Out with the Old. And I was showing you sort of a, a teaser of the project we're in the middle of. I mean, it's winter, so... Not all your gardening stuff is just planting and growing plants. There's there's some other infrastructure stuff that we're doing. This particular project is getting an area out there in the front yard ready to put in a patio. And around the patio, a grape arbor. The grapes will be growing up. The grape, grape arbor will be called Skupernong. That's a variety, the bronze skin variety of the muscadine grape. So it's going to be the, uh, the green bronze colored muscadine. That's the Native American grape. And I found some really nice vines on desperate to try out there to see if they're going to grow. I know they like to grow with a little bit of shade, so they're going to be to the slightly to the north uh, northwest of one of our big pecan trees, and I've had to do some pruning on the pecan tree to accommodate it and everything, and I've been putting the post in this particular week, so hopefully um, sometime soon I'll have a video up where you can see where I'm actually getting the space leveled. I started out a couple weeks ago, I showed you pulling up the old papers because I did a horrible job. This is, I just rolled out some ground mat and laid the papers down and went, well, I guess it's more or less there. And it's like, no, it's not. It's not level. It's not straight. It's not flat. It's not ready to go at all. It was it was horrible. So, so I ripped all that out. And uh, the next video you see in that project will show you how to go about taking a space in your yard or anywhere, really, and getting a, a flat area, a large, broad, flat area perfectly level or you know as close to perfectly level as as as, as us crazy folks are going to be able to get it there's donna griggs hello donna wow there's some there's some folks i haven't seen in a while anyway i'll be showing that part and then the video after that i'll show you the setting of the posts and i might talk a little bit about the mistake that i made while setting one of them and some of the products that are available for uh for doing this sort of a project pitfalls obviously you don't want you don't want to repeat my mistakes <laughs> vicky's saying it does will be plenty for this year now until i have put, now i have to plan for next year what's the price do we have anything you want would you be happy to oh man um uh, some 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 native some nice native elderberry would be good if you got some uh if you can get me a couple of sticks a couple of good green sticks of elderberry that would be awesome I would say persimmon and sassafras, but I've got sassafras coming from a friend um, up there around Tahlequah. Well, he lives next door, but his, his his land's up around Tahlequah where they actually have some. And next trip he makes out to the old homestead, he's going to grab some for himself and for me. And I'm probably going to propagate it all around the all around the the green belt next door to us too. Persimmon would be nice, but I am really running out of space, so I think elderberry would be great. I, I can probably fit some elderberry in. 
<laughs> anything else i'm probably gonna have to wait until i expand and move out to a larger place before i um before i, I, I get around to, to, to putting anything else in i have plans for some plums and for some cherries i've got space for the cherries the plums are going to have to wait until either the red buds on the street front die or until i've gone ahead until we've gone ahead and bulldozed uh mary's mom's house which is next door we've got it paid off we've got lights put up on it we got the big sycamore down. Oh, I've got a really good, I've got a really good project coming up to show you on that sycamore stump and how you can treat a big stump if you've got one. Lots of fun. That's it's going to be great. Um, the part that I didn't put into video, I've already done, which is going around the outer edge with a little bit of diesel fuel and just brushing the cambium layer with that to make sure that it won't grow back at all next year. So all of that's going to have to wait. All that's going to have to wait until springtime, which is exactly what I got the mushrooms from spawn for. But I've got another thing to show you, which is going to be a lot of fun. And you're just going to have to wait. I'm just going to keep you in suspense. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but um, it'll be fun. Let's see what else. Oh, coming up here in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to do some planting in the middle of winter, which is going to be interesting. Planting in the middle of winter. Um might sound weird, but there are some plants, some seeds that need a bit of cold stratification period. And you may as well, if you're not going to be stratifying them in the fridge, going ahead and stratifying them outside where they're going to be growing. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing with some marshmallow and some cattails, which are going into a little a little um, marshy area or a, a lowland area that I'm deliberately trying to create. Vicky says, I have an abundance of wild elderberries and a really nice patch of wild persimmons. I See, I knew, a couple, when was it? A few months back, we were talking, and, and I said, take a look. I bet you've got a bunch of persimmons out there. And he's like, I don't know if I have a bunch of You've got persimmons. I, I know that, that that area. You've got persimmons. It would be weird if you didn't. We'll put it that way. And you might have a cherry or two out there, too. It's, well, they're fewer and farther between. Persimmon is going to be out there. Sassafras is going to be out there, too. Let me scroll up here and have a look at chat real quick. Uh, Mary says she made a video of why she was late. What? Why were you late? All right, we'll have to check that out later. Eric says 65 degrees today here in Indiana. I mean, really nice weather, but you got a cold snap coming from what I hear. Uh, we had lots of strong, strong, I mean, strong wind today. Coming up from the south, it was blowing hard. I was looking over there at the RV shop next door, watching with some of that sheet metal go pop, 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 and thinking, you know, I probably ought to move my truck. Yeah, I'm going to move the truck because <laughs> right now, if that thing comes off, it'll it'll get as far as where I put the post for the grape arbor, and that'll stop it. But a couple of years back, we had a piece come off that same RV shop, and it shredded one of our Bartlett pear trees. And it did some serious damage to one of the pecan trees. Pecan bounced back, but that Bartlett is only now starting to recover. Sassafras Red said, wind wicked in Illinois, upper 70s, but the wind kind of scary. Yeah, it was. Right? Down here down here in, in the prairie, it was, it was pretty bad. Joe saying, hello, Jason. So no moon rocks for souvenirs to sell, us, sell to us, your fellow earthlings? I have no moon rocks, unfortunately, which is not to, not to say that there aren't any. I just, I don't have any. Hmm. I imagine those things got snatched up, but quick. They, they talk about how, how you look at the collections and there aren't really any moon rocks in the collections. Well, yeah, no, duh. I mean, considering that we've got a government operated as a, well, I can't say it's operated by criminals because the very definition of government is a criminal enterprise. So, yeah, we've got a bunch of criminals that were in charge of the last moon mission. <laughs> you think any of those rocks are going to actually be around where people can get their hands on? Okay, no. They're in somebody's collection by now. All right. Vicky's saying, unfortunately, mistakes are the best teachers. Well, yeah, they are. So whenever you make them, just go, okay. It was a teaching moment. And hopefully it wasn't too expensive. I, I had that mistake whenever I was I was, I was hanging this post. I, I decided I'm going to get it perfectly level, perfectly plumb by hanging it from my stepladder. And I've got a stepladder that stretches up to 
the lower stratosphere. So I put it up there and I made a harness and I hung that post from it and I put it down the ground and, and, and got it to the point where it was where I wanted it. It's, you know, the right spacing and everything is straight up and down. It's perfectly level. I got this, this urethane foam stuff ready, opened up, poured it in there, got it started. It went, all right, that's good. We got it set. And then the next thing I knew, I turned around and looked and noticed that although, yes, it's still perfectly straight up and down, the wind made it rotate slightly. So I've got one post that's about eh, 15 or 20 degrees rotated. It's okay. We're going to cover that up with lattice work that the grapes will climb up and nobody will notice anyway. <clears throat> but now you know. Joe's saying, hi, Eric. I've also seen you at Chicken Johnny streams. Yeah, I've got Chicken Johnny as one of my, my one of my featured channels. I try to have in, in feature channels those kind of channels that are also doing some gardening work and things like that, but maybe not all the same thing. So if you're interested in vermicompost and worm farming, go to Green Greg's. He's, he knows an awful lot about, a verm, about vermicost and worm farming. He's also an engineer for NASA, which kind of helps. He's got another channel called the Galactic Greg's. He's a hoot. You'll enjoy watching his stuff. There's also, let me see, um, the Survival Channel with David the Good, which is all manner of wonderful tips and hints for people that are trying to develop their own survival gardens, including propagation tips and a variety of other things, food forest, grocery row, row gardening, straight row gardening. If there's a way to grow food, David the Good is going to show you how to do it. He's going to do a great job of it, and he's pretty good with the guitar, too. Well, better than I am, anyway. <clears throat> and, oh, he's got another kid coming, which is going to be kind of cool. I don't know how many he's up to now. 11, 12 kids? 11 kids? I think there's just, there's either is it him, the wife, 10 kids, 11 kids. It's a lot of kids, and he's growing food for all of them. So check out the Survival Gardening Channel with David the Good. That's one of those. Of course, uh, Chicken Johnny is one of those folks that does his gardening in the backyard for a market garden with a tractor. Not a big tractor, not we're not talking major farming operations, but a small mini compact or compact uh, gardening tractor that the usual homesteader might have available to them. So he'll show you how to do things that particular way. There's no one set way to do anything. There's there's the way I do it, and I really love the way I do it. I'm really excited and enthusiastic about the way I do it. But yeah, it's not the only way to do things. And that's, of course, the reason why I have so many of these various and sundry different channels that you can go and look at and see, well, that's that's the way somebody else is doing it. That's, the, that's more my speed, or that's something I can get into. Speaking of something that just about everybody can get into, there's um, Scott Head, Black Gumbo Southern Gardening for one of my future channels. If you've got a backyard, he will show you how to go about growing in a backyard strictly as a suburban backyard gardener, which is wonderful. All kinds of great tips and information on uh, Scott has a Black Gummo Southern Gardening Channel, also one of our featured channels back there. All right. Let me see here. Da -da. Now, Brian wants to know what the story is with the moon landing is. Well, you know, Brian, if you've been here, if you've been here when we started, if you've been here 20 minutes ago, you would already know. But since you weren't here 20 minutes ago, I'm going to make you wait. But I'm going to repeat some of the same jokes. All right. So you guys know. <laughs> what with all the supply chain issues out there, it's getting harder and harder to get a case of Corona. Yeah, that's true. But you can still get the, the one quart size. There you go. Hmm. That's my beverage for tonight. All right. And for you latecomers, I wanted you to know the website, greencountryagroforestry.com, now has a new product available, and it is this. These are seedling starts. I'm a liar. They're not seedlings. They're from cutting starts of rosemary, our rosemary bush, upon the heavy frosts of this, this past winter, I took and gathered some cuttings and went to work at making sure that we would have rosemary just in case that bush died out. And so this is one of the cuttings from a 10-year-old rosemary bush that we have started. 
capable of growing in zone 7a oklahoma here on the prairie with all the frost and snow and ice and everything else i would still recommend if you're in zone 7a to put this on the south side of your house to protect it just a little bit but uh for you people further south it'll have no problems whatsoever we have these available on the website greencountryagroforestry.com now greencountryagroforestry.com we have these available to ship for house plants at the moment don't plant these outside until after your last frost. They're evergreens. Evergreens don't like going out in the middle of the winter. Okay. Brian's saying it's supposed to have 60 mile per hour winds here. He's in Minnesota after midnight. Oh, I'll bet. I'll bet you're getting ready to get buried under it too. Test press thread says, I wish I was in the woods in Arkansas. Yeah. Man, it's crazy life. Donna Griggs, that is, says we had high winds in Colorado today. Lots of destruction. Oh, I bet. I mean, it's, it's just been roaring, roaring down the plains and all, all across the central U.S. Joe says, you're so lucky. I re recently discovered a wild vine called uh, Taliote here in central Mexico. Cousin to the coyote, good one, tender, but once the skin gets rough, it's like alligator skin. Oof. Oh, talking to, talking to, 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 to Vicky and, and, and the stuff that she's got. She's got a lot of good stuff. Of course, you can still get uh, you can still get prickly pears out here. Frozen World says, "What's your opinion on the GSM and what can we plant or plant during this time?" Hey, that's a really good question, Frozen World. I'm glad you asked it. Uh, you know, climate change is a reality. It's been going on since well, there's been there's been a reality. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was no life at all on this on this dust ball that we call Earth. But the climate changed, fortunately, and now life can exist here. And the climate continues to change, usually for the same reasons, which are, are very largely cosmic. Motions of the planets and the sun. And very slowly but surely, life will, will, will assert itself and, and adapt to new situations here on planet Earth. Of course, you know what the big problem with the dinosaurs was. The big problem with the dinosaurs was they were not able to adapt when their climate changed. Humans don't have this problem. Humans have an amazing ability to adapt and use our intelligence to come up with, with, with technological solutions to problems to help us adapt to things like a changing climate. So um, GSM, Grand Solar Minimum, it happens. It's on a cycle, and it happens on a fairly regular basis. Um, when is the next one? Jeez, I don't know. It, we should be editing into it or coming out of it. I, maybe we just experienced it. Uh, problem is a lot of these major events there's nobody alive that's gone through them that could tell us well this is what it's going to be like so if we, since we don't have that living reference we have to look at historical references and unfortunately uh for some of the extremes the historical references have been relegated to the the, the, the realm of myth and fantasy practically things where, where people a long time ago recorded major events occurring in the heavens and, and now it just seems like well how could that happen it's outside of our normal frame of reference is what I'm trying to say. And these things do happen. Um, we live in a cosmic shooting gallery. There's going to be asteroids and comets and all kinds of things that come through and 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 bedevil a, a people or a culture that's bound to one single planet. And you're going to have to either find a way to adapt and survive those events when they occur or eventually build up to the point where you can go out and colonize other places so that if something happens to one dust ball, well, we've got others. But that requires some planning and forethought. We'll start out with, well, what can we do now and how can we adapt? Uh, start out with looking for plants that you can grow. They're going to grow like weeds. Plants that you can grow that are going to produce food for you, whether you're uh, actively going out and tending them or not. I've got a wide variety of those that we're trialing and some that I'm very happy to report high success with. Uh, I just recently did one on, on the canna lily. Which is not a true lily. It's a member of the Canacea family, not a member of the Liliacea family. Although at one time they were considered to be lilies. This is why they still have the name Canna Lily. As a root crop, this one is phenomenal. Now, I, I, I've been singing its praises as a, a um, I don't want to say lettuce substitute because that would be incorrect. It's a daylily substitute. Uh, during the during the spring and the summer, you're looking for uh, a nice, crunchy, leafy thing to put into your bowl to go along with a little bit of carrot and maybe some radish and tomato and a little bit of dressing of some sort. You might call it a salad green. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be green. Um, 
people are, are accustomed to using lettuce as a salad green. Sometimes they use um, young baby beet greens as a salad green. If you're looking at the bull's blood beet, it has a nice sort of reddish colored leaf that shows up in salad mixes, uh, arugula, things like that. These, these are all salad greens. But lettuce. Lettuce should not be your go-to salad green. Your go-to salad green should be daylily petals. Daylily is Hemerocallus fulva. It's not a true lily, once again. At one time, it was classified in the lily AC family. That's why they call it a lily, but it is not a lily. Uh, all true lilies have bulbs, and most of them are toxic. I wouldn't eat them. Other things have tubers, not bulbs. You can tell the difference when you compare them side by side. I could get you a daffodil, which is a bulb, and a, 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 a daylily and put them side by side. You'll be able to tell the difference. I'll do that in the video pretty soon. I'll do that. Couple of daffodils up so you can see. The bulbs, don't eat them. Unless unless it's an onion, unless it's an allium, allium bulbs are okay. You can eat those. But if it's a bulb and it doesn't taste like an onion, mm, don't eat it. It's probably poisonous. Or it could be. If you don't know for sure, don't eat it. <laughs> anyway, can of lilies, day lilies. Both of these not true lilies, but excellent sources of food. Um, the day lily petals. Whenever you put them into your salad bowl, have a taste that is much, much better than the best, the best quality butter crunch lettuce you could get your hands on. Once you've tried them, you'll realize lettuce is a daylily substitute, not the other way around. And of course, the flowers to, to can of lilies are, are a wonderful substitute for a daylily later on in the season, whenever you want something to go into your salad bowl. But I've discovered that the tubers are, once again, phenomenal. They're excellent. Uh, recently, I did one video that you can probably catch called How to Cook a Canna. And I took some of the canna that, that, that we grew, some of that wasn't putting it aside. So, okay, we're going to show from the point where we cut off the greenery, which has died back during the winter, dig those roots up, separate them out, and then we're going to, to, to parboil them and then peel them and then cook them. And I've got a better method of peeling the, uh, the canna roots than I showed in that video. The, the method I showed was okay. It's fairly quick, but the method I've got now, even faster. And I've got another cooking video coming up where I'm going to be making a stew out of just all different kinds of stuff that we grew right here around us. And I'll show you that method of preparation there too. Uh, so things like that, cannas, daylilies. These are strawberries, blueberries, uh, pecan trees, hazelnuts. Um, try some sweet potatoes. Things that are capable of growing really, really well, preferably with a minimum of input from us. That's things to, to look, look at planting. If you look at something that grows like a weed and you can use it for food, try to adapt it more for using it for food and be appreciative that it grows like a weed. Because whenever the climate changes, whenever things get weird, those plants that are capable of growing like weeds will do well. And the ones that you have to pamper and baby and the circumstances have to be just right to get them to grow, grow in your climate. Well, those aren't going to do so well. So that's the sort of things you should be looking forward to having in your garden. And if you've got cannas and you're from zone, I, I hear they grow up to zone five, maybe. So five on down into the tropics. Uh, it's a great plant to grow. Lots and lots of calories in those tubers and they taste wonderful. All right. Fortunately, Vicky says she's so far down in the ravine that the storms aren't reaching her. Unfortunately. <laughs> yep, you, you get temperatures there 20 degrees colder than on the ridge. There, there you go. Joe, I actually have not heard of the Taliotis. I'll have to go look into them and, and research. They, they don't really grow right where we're at. I get I get some of those, I get some of those uh some of those, those Central American and, and extreme uh, Southern North American continent sort of stuff, but man, uh, some of them no, I, I haven't I haven't had the the pleasure of experiencing as of yet. There have been a few things that come from from around uh, Southern Mexico that I've tried out that I really liked, but I'm having a, just a hard time growing them. Uh, for example, cumin. I should be able to grow cumin, but I have not been able to to get it to grow. So I'm not putting any in the uh, in the stew that I'm making right now. This is the reason I'm not using this 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 camera. Incidentally, this one here got plugged in, charging back up. I was shooting some of that video uh, earlier today, trying to make the stew. I was showing the okay. Here's the new peeling technique for the for the cannas. Um, 
I chopped up those. I put in some carrots. I put in some, uh, we have both uh, the Egyptian walking onion and some garlic that I'm growing. We'll pull those up, showed how to chop those up green. But all of that's available right now. I just go pull it up right out of the ground. I had some um, sweet potato that I dehydrated. Some of the potato, sweet potato that I grew, I went ahead, chopped it up, put it in the dehydrator, dehydrated. It's like, you know, this would be great. I'll have the sweet potato here and we can like just take a handful out, throw it in the soup. And we've got that extra, you know, that extra vitamin supplement in there from the sweet potatoes. Um, there's some uh, some sun-dried tomatoes in there and I, I put in a little bit of ham as well. So it's, 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 it's going to come out to be a pretty good stew. Uh, oh, and I put... Um, I put uh, drying blank here. Szechuan peppers. Put some Szechuan pepper in there. And Mary, I got out the herb grinder. I ground up the Szechuan peppers. So you're not going to get a whole pepper for them. You'll bite into it and go, woo, where are you? And make your tongue numb. But it uh, has a really nice citrusy, peppery flavor to it. Because it has been advised to get a four by four golf cart to get where I want to put my Chinese greenhouse. Oh man, I don't know. Um, I might look into some of those, some of those four wheelers that they've got that where you can where you can actually hook up a trailer to it and do some work with it. Other than just getting from point A to point B, there's a, there might be a little bit of a price point difference between the between a golf cart and a and a functioning farm or or, or, or backcountry four by four. But it might be worth looking into to see if you get the maybe the, the slightly better machine. Uh, you buy cheap, you get cheap, and it's a lot better to, to save your money and buy the thing that you really want right off the bat instead of spending some money on something that's not quite what you want, and then more money on something that's a little bit closer, and then more money on what you finally wanted. You know, by the time you finally get done, you got what you wanted, but you spend a whole lot more of extra money getting there. So. Maybe look into it. See what. See if uh, one of those, one of those four wheelers might be good. Kitty, what are you doing? Oh, okay. Kitty says meow. meow. Oh, hey, that's my hand. Don't bite it. <laughs> Corona es muy bueno. You know, if you like beer, <laughs> here's another advertisement. If you like beer. La Corona Familiar, Cerveza Mas Fina, is muy bueno. As a matter of fact, this is the this is the beer, I kid you not, that Budweiser wishes it was. Because it's it's a Pilsner, but it has a very, very, very nice flavor to it. As opposed to that flavorless stuff that you get out of the can that we're not going to discuss anymore. All right. Vicky's saying, I grew up in cold country. I remember too well taking a deep breath and having the hairs on my nostril freeze all the way down to my lung. Oosh. We had some really cold days out here on the prairie. Uh, usually we get them in February. That's about that's about when it gets cold here, about right around February. And then there's a couple of weeks where you walk outside and it's it's you're you're in the Arctic, and then everything comes back to normal. It's one of the things that makes growing here really interesting. We've got a wonderful long cool season in the fall going into winter which is great and then from spring going into summer it's really really short we'll, we'll go from being frozen to within 30 days 80 plus degrees so i've had some some interesting challenges i've tried growing potatoes early in the spring and found i didn't really have enough time for the for the plants to fully develop by the time it got too hot and they didn't want to develop anymore so this year i'm trying growing potatoes during the fall season. I still got potatoes out there. As a matter of fact, today, today's the first day I could start harvest, harvesting potatoes. So I'm going to go out probably tomorrow if it's not nasty and I'll, I'll see if we've got some uh, Yukon Gold or Pontiac Craig potatoes, regular potatoes that I can pull up. Of course, middle of winter is a great time to pull up things like your cannas. It's a great time to uh, to separate them out and replant them, divide them up and put them in new places. So uh, coming up this next year, we'll have the 24 down the row on the south side of the driveway and then another 44 
in the front yard. And if the average that we are pulling in here is about 15 pounds of usable food per plant, whenever I do that harvest um, come fall, just counting front yard side and, and, and side of the driveway, what is that? Uh, 24 and 44, that's 68 multiplied by 15. Who's got their calculator? I know I've got one around here somewhere. Let me see. Let me bring this up. 15 pounds each times 68 plants. That's just 1,020 pounds of food. It's not a whole lot. 1,020 pounds of, of, of a, a calorie dense root crop. It's 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 minimal. You know, it's just that's 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 just the front yard and beside the driveway, and that's only one plant in a multiple layer setup. It includes seven layers. That's, that's one plant. All right. So, are we going to have enough food to eat around here? Oh, I don't know. yeah. As long as you don't mind eating potatoes. Because that's exactly what the can of tastes like. It tastes just like a potato. It's got plenty of starch, a little bit of dietary fiber. It tastes like a potato with substance. That's about it. <laughs> Unfortunately for humans, cockroaches are more adaptable. Well, maybe. But they can't build underground shelters, and they can't make air conditioners, and they can't start fires and do other fun stuff. Brian saying, what the heck was that other root you were cooking the other day? That was called canna. It's a, it, it is the root of the canna lily. And it tastes almost exactly like a russet Burbank potato. If you get one of those russet Burbank potatoes you, and, you, and you take it and you wrap it in foil and you roast it in the oven until it gets just that perfect point of tenderness and steaminess and you open up the, the foil and you haven't put any butter or anything else on it yet, but you just dig your fork in there and pull out a little piece and go, assuming it's cool enough that it doesn't burn your tongue and, and melt the top of your mouth. That flavor, that's what cannas taste like. Exactly what they taste like. Only they have a little bit of fiber, which potatoes don't. So if you're looking for a calorie food that is not going to make you spend your time on the toilet, wishing that you stocked up more toilet paper, then try cannas instead of just potatoes for a staple starch. Just saying. All right. Daniel says, awesome at night, y'all. We'll listen to it tomorrow. Peace. Peace out, Daniel. Mary's coming back. Prison world says, half truth, red cause the world is it all about mod I can't. moderations and accommodation. That's me know how to get out there and farm and work. You know, it's true. Getting out there and actually growing all of your own food. I mean, this, this is a serious challenge. I saw a fellow a couple years back called uh, Rob Greenfield that decided, and this he's a younger fellow. He decided that he was going to go down to Florida and work at growing his own food for a year, either growing or foraging it. And I thought, you know what? If this young kid can do it, then me with a whole bunch of uh, background in, in, in growing food as a, a farmer's kid from a, a well-established and well-respected farming family here in the, the, the Tulsa County and Cherokee County and well, all over Northeast Oklahoma area, uh, I should be able to do something like that myself. Now, I've got one-third of an acre with uh, two houses and some assorted outbuildings, but all the other space in between, I should probably be able to find a way that I can produce enough food to at least feed myself and hopefully up to three other people. And I'm thinking that's not going to be a problem. <laughs> and I didn't know it at the time that Canada was going to be such a huge, a huge uh, jump forward in, in, uh, in, in food production. I was thinking more along the lines of, you know, 10, 15 years from now with all the hazelnut trees producing, with all the pecan trees producing, with all the, the other other plants that take some time to grow and, and, and get to maturity. I was thinking at that point, maybe we could possibly feed four people's worth. But I'm thinking that that day is going to arrive a lot sooner. And then the question becomes, well, what's the real upward number for, 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 for how many people you can support on an acre? Because I was thinking 12 would be a nice easy to reach number now i'm thinking 12 is 12 is very small and if 12 is very small then the number of people that planet earth can support is well beyond 80 billion well well beyond 80 billion 
that's not even getting into the, the, the abundance of the rivers, lakes, streams, and oceans. That's just if we took the arable land, the part that we work right now are putting to the plow and farming, if we took just that part and converted it to a multi-tiered forest garden system, lots of people getting fed, like I said, in excess of 80 billion. And of course, we changed the paradigm uh, for, for, for growing food to being, you go to the grocery store to get everything and you're dependent upon the grocery store and dependent upon money. Not anymore. You, you go outside your front door to get your food and you're not dependent upon money to live. So we can use money for things that money is more useful for. All right. Anyway. Test mm. spread say in these south winds from the south of December seem to be more common over the last three three years at least. Yeah, a little bit more. Let's see. Brian saying you want to challenge try starting strawberry, tobacco, or roses from seed. Yeah, I'll bet. I've tried starting tobacco from seed. It was not easy, and I did not have success in all actuality. I managed to grow some tobacco plants from seedlings that somebody else had started. My own seed starts didn't really make it, but um, from doing a lot of watching David the Good uh, <laughs> and buying, let me see, I actually have it right here, buying his book, conveniently titled Free Plants for Everyone, right there. I've gotten a little bit more confidence in my ability to start and propagate things like tobacco from seeds. So I'm ready to try it again one of these days. Just probably not this year. We'll see. Chess Press Risk says, I want to grow tobacco next spring. Any advice? Brian, there you go. <laughs> Brian, you're going to be the go-to. How to grow tobacco guy. I'm looking at growing a uh, Nicotinum Sylvestris, which is a woodland tobacco, a perennial tobacco, not really one that you grow for its nicotine content, one that you grow for its opening for for its night blooming flowers with their pleasant scent that i want to put in the far back corner to try to attract mosquitoes away from the, the public areas so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking let's give the mosquitoes a something with nectar in it that blooms at night that's going to pull them and pull them away from everyone else and then we can also harvest some leaves and use that as an emergency in case of we can we can cook those down and make a, an emergency uh, nicotinoid insecticide for those extreme emergency cases where we haven't been able to get control pests with birds or or other benevolent uh, predatory insects. It's always nice to have options, even if you don't wind up using them. <laughs> Brian says, yes, careful consideration and study. <laughs> Toss the tobacco seeds over shoulder, then they grow. <laughs> is it time to call my insurance agent yeah yeah well will they be there that's the question um they're probably gone home for the day hmm. yes joe la corona oh la corona better than Budweiser. modello did a good job Excellent pills. Excellent pilsner. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Sass press press says, I think I'm going to try the older over the shoulder method. Maybe that'll work if everything else hasn't. Uh, Nick says, Sorry, I disappeared to track a reference. Rick Austin has three books and a few videos on survivalist gardener. A shaman. Waffle? Really? Central Florida, about to pull up some sweet potatoes from the garden. I grew 20 pounds in six months in a 7 by 10 bed. Think about growing them in buckets to open the bed for other crops. Um, you know, you could look at um, Bake a Leg and Let's Dig It Homestead. That, uh, that, that, that gal grew some sweet potatoes in a bucket, and you can see how hers turned out if you wanted to, 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 to get a, a sort of a preview. It worked for her. Uh, I'm going to recommend lots of space in your bucket if you can get maybe some of those nutrient tubes nutrient tubes nutrient tubs <laughs> Can't talk. nutrient tubs if you, if you know somebody that's, that's that's raising cattle get the nutrient tubs after they use them they they, they have these you know the licks where the cow, cows come out and, and get their nutrients out and once those are empty they're about that big around 
a good maybe 30 gallons at least you can grow some 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 good root crops in that another thing you might consider doing if you got problems like we do with gophers now my method of, of dealing with the gophers has been to lay out um, hardware cloth on the ground and then put uh, cinder blocks on either side of it to hold it in and then digging the dirt from around and putting that in the middle so i've created essentially a raised bed area with the cinder blocks for walls and hardware cloth underneath that the gophers can't get up underneath and get to the to to my roots that's going to work for my carrots and if i extend them up a little bit they'll probably work for sweet potatoes next year and i've got a a, a method of growing more more sweet potatoes in less space that I'll, I'll show you off this 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 next year coming up. That's going to be kind of fun. I've got to do some, got to do some groundwork, and I got to haul some more cinder blocks. I got to get some more cinder blocks. That's going to be a project and a half. Brian says my window is open. I can smell the static electricity. You guys are going to get some storms. You surely are. Vicky's saying, what's important is finding out how many calories can be grown in the garden. Greens are important, but not enough to keep us fed. You know, I did a video last year. It, it was fairly successful. It was called Starving with a Garden Full of Food. And it's true. There, there are a lot of us out there. We're growing gardens, and we got we got a little bit of that sweet corn. We got some squash. We got those, you know, those zucchini and yellow crooknecks. Got a few peas, maybe some beans here and there. You know, you know got those butter beans that, you know, mom always liked. Maybe some cabbage, some lettuce, some carrots, some radishes, a little bit of onions, and a few potatoes. And I was like, well, yeah, we got a garden full of food. But as far as calories go, we don't have that much. And calories count. Calories, oh, calories count big time. And if we're not growing staples, if we're not growing calories, then we can grow food in our garden. But it's it's mainly just for seasonings and accents, and it's not really enough to really feed us. Now, right now, I can go and I can harvest canna lilies, and I can survive till doomsday off of canna roots and I need more than just canna roots otherwise I'm just going to get bored but there's enough calories there to sustain not only me but two or three other people as well and by next year more so right now she's uh, 24 yeah, 24 plants at about 15 pounds of plant um that's 12 times 30 6 times 60 about 360 pounds 360 pounds of of, of of starchy root crop that just came out of just that spot just to the south of, of the driveway the seven layer forest and that's just one of the seven plants out of there so yeah we've got food it's not a problem not a problem at all <laughs> brian says the best thing to do, thing to do is work that's what i say at a job <laughs> yeah i mean how many people are hiring right now? There's just not enough people out there working. Hmm. That'll get you money. And money will buy stuff. I certainly do like the stuff that money buys. Okay, Brian, you've been waiting patiently, so I'll tell you. You know, I didn't go to the moon. And I'd be willing to bet you didn't go to the moon either. If you didn't go to the moon and I didn't go to the moon, then we did not go to the moon. Buzz Aldrin might have. Neil Armstrong might have. But we didn't. <laughs> so anybody, anytime somebody says, we didn't go to the moon, you can just nod and say, yeah, we didn't. And then change the subject really quickly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, bake a leg and let's dig it homestead. She grew, she grew sweet potatoes in a, in, in a, it was a very large container, one of those, one of those large planting containers. And it turned out okay for her. Um, 
It probably would have turned out better if she'd had more containers and taken her slips and spread them out over more containers, which I got onto her right at the beginning of the year. I said, oh, you're putting like six slips into one of these 30-gallon containers. They're going to grow, but you're going to get small potatoes out. And they're completely and totally filled with, with potatoes. So there you go. I did not write a song about this. This is this is this is just that little lick that I was working with uh, two weeks ago, that 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 we were playing around with. I said, you know, there's 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 probably something in this. Told them to stop mooning peeps. <laughs> oh, I don't subscribe to a lot of conspiracy theories. Um, it's just a lot of things can very easily be explained by by greed and incompetence, and you don't have to have to to, to look for some sort of a, a, a global cabal trying to make things weird on you. Most of the time, it's just simple greed and incompetence. All right, but as we all know, the world rests on the back of several elephants, floating through the void on the back of a giant turtle. The only question is, what is the gender of the turtle? <laughs> All right. That really is all I've got for you guys. Thank you for joining me this evening as we discussed why it is that um, we did not go to the moon and other interesting topics of conversation. I hope you found the video informative or entertaining or maybe a little bit of both. And if you did, well, you know what to do. I will catch you next time. Oh, and of course, don't forget, don't forget, GreenCountryAgroForestry.com. We now have rosemary plants available for sale. Rosemary plants are now available for sale at GreenCountryAgroForestry.com. As well, of course, as the uh, Hemarchalis fulva, the orange daylily, the classic daylilies. And in case you missed it previously, I'll go ahead. From the very beginning... This is announcing, of course, a new channel that I've got started up. It's called The Guild Channel, The Guild Channel, which is uh, dedicated to the DDO online game, which uh, is free to play. And if you join up right now with DDO online free to play, you can put in the promo code DDO Quest 2021 and get a whole boatload of content for free. And uh, I think all the way up until December December the 31st for 99 DDO points each, which is uh, pocket change, you can pick up the, the three of the major expansions over the past couple of years, which is the Forgotten Realms campaign setting, the Ravenloft campaign setting, and another uh, another part called uh, uh, Shadow Over Wayland, which is a, an addendum to the, the, the uh, Forgotten Realms campaign setting. 99 DDO points is about maybe three or four hours worth of gameplay to get the favor required to purchase it. But you can buy the DDO points for about, that was $6.99. You get 600 DDO points, which is more than enough to get those three expansions. What I'm trying to say is if you're looking for a Christmas present for a young un or an old un, uh, DDO online, get them, a, get them an account, set them up and uh, they'll enjoy it. They've even got a guild available that they can join. If they don't mind hanging out with crusty old, Mm, uh, fellows like myself, <laughs> and of course, Mary is Tulsa Fox, and of course, all of you fine gardening folks. Let's go ahead and play the trailer for the Guild Channel right now, and uh, hopefully, it will pique your interest. Of course, keep in mind. Hi, my name is Mae Vani. How do you do? 
My name's Sharon. You worms had better not forget it. All right, there we go. That's that's the trailer for the Guild channel. The Guild is called Sa the Sacred Order of the Azure Flame on the Argonessen server. It's 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 the Guild is just basically Mary and myself. We're now accepting new people, particularly if they came in from YouTube, um, and, and we have a lot of fun playing this game. Uh, unlike some video games massively and multiplaying online computer games where you're often in competition with other players. There's a lot of player versus player action and you're, you're, you're trying to get ahead in the game and you discover you just can't because all these people that came before you spend a lot of money on the game and they've got the really good gear and they're just beating you up and you just can't do anything. This is not a problem on Dungeons and Dragons online because PVP is purely consensual and only for fun. Anything that you want to accomplish in the game, you can accomplish without doing PvP. Furthermore, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, games say they're free to play, but you get into and discover that there's limitations to what you can do until you've paid money. This is not a problem on Dungeons and Dragons Online. Anything functional and practical that you want to do in the game, you can do without paying any real money. So it, it's free to pay option. Really is free to pay or free to play. Yeah, there we go. Anyway, so there's our little bit of commercial for uh, for the, the new channel and, um, of course, for our new product, which we've got coming out. Uh, until we're sold out, I've only, I only propagated 50 of the rosemary bushes. I've got the limit set at 20 right now because I'm going to keep a few for myself. And then we'll try to grow some more next year. <laughs> Alrighty, guys, once again, thank you very much for joining me tonight. I hope you found the video informative or entertaining. I will catch you.